Welcome everyone to today's uh, Manufacturing Week webinar series. Today's webinar is on protecting your manufacturing business from IP theft. My name is Jeremy Ocek. I'm a member of the firm at Bond, Shannick & King. I practice in the Intellectual Property Department and I will be presenting today's seminar. This seminar is part of the uh, Manufacturing Week webinar series. Uh, this is the second in a series of five presentations. Yesterday's presentation was on cybersecurity. Tomorrow's presentation uh, will be on wage and hour traps for the manufacturing industry. Thursday's presentation is on avoiding OSHA liabilities. And Friday concludes uh, with a session on immigration issues in the manufacturing industry. So IP theft, so according to the, to the FBI, intellectual property theft cost American companies billions of dollars each year. So this is obviously a huge issue. Um, and the theft can come from both internal and external sources, internal from personnel, vendors, supply chain, external sources can be from uh, counterfeit products, etc. And so manufacturing account companies are especially prone to damage from IP theft um, due to stolen designs, business intelligence, counterfeit products, etc. So that set the, sets the stage for today's uh, uh, webinar. So what we hope to cover is uh, basically three core areas. IP basics, we'll go over sort of the basics of uh, IP protection to uh, lay the foundation of some of the things that we'll be talking about later on. We'll address risks and vulnerabilities, especially to the manufacturing industry. And then we'll conclude with a series of best practices to protect IP in the manufacturing industry. So let's start with IP basics. So generally there are four types of intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. Now these four areas of IP protection are not mutually exclusive. In fact, uh, it's possible to have each type of these intellectual property protections uh, cover a certain aspect of your manufacturing products. For example, you could have a patented product that you manufacture. That patented product could be branded and protected with trademarks. You may supply instruction manuals or training manuals with those with that patented product, which could be copyrighted. And there may be trade secrets that go into the production of that patented product. And so it's possible um, for any one or all four of these IP protections to protect uh, manufactured goods and the associated processes uh, used to make those goods. So let's delve in a little bit deeper into each of these four areas. Let's start with patents. So what is a patent? A patent is a right granted by a U the US government or a foreign government, and that is a right to exclude others from practicing your patented invention. And so it's often characterized as a limited monopoly, and it allows you uh, to go after others that you think are infringing your patent. It's a right that you must assert on your own. Uh, the, the government, or, uh, no other entity will um, enforce the patent for you. It's a self-enforcing right, but it gives you the right to go after others who you believe are infringing your patent. A patent gives you uh, the possibility of a number of important things, one of which includes damages to recover from any infringement um, from somebody uh, using your patented invention. And so you may be entitled to compensation if you can improve that infringement. The damages uh, either include lost profits, if you can show that your competitor uh, sold the product but for you being in the market, or at minimum you can be entitled to a reasonable royalty. Perhaps the most important uh, remedy offered by a patent is the possibility of injunctive relief, the ability to stop your competitor from selling a, uh, your patented product 
uh, can be very powerful. Okay, so there are a couple types of patents, and we'll cover we'll cover the uh, the two main types of patents. We'll start with utility patents. Utility patents are the patents that usually, uh, when the word patent is spoken um, in common parlance, people are generally referring to utility patents. A utility patent covers any new and useful process, a machine, an article of manufacture, or a composition of matter, or any improvement to one of those things. So in the manufacturing space, what that means is it may apply to your manufactured goods. It could apply to your methods of manufacturing those goods. And or it can apply to the machines used to make those goods, or all three. And the term of a patent in the United States is 20 years from the filing of the initial application. It usually takes two to three to four years for a patent to issue. And so uh, the useful life on a patent ends up um, usually being somewhere around 17 years. Uh, and during that time, as I started off by saying, you have a limited monopoly. So that can be uh, pretty powerful um, in the competitive space. Now, I, I mentioned that uh, utility patents can apply to the manufa to manufactured goods themselves, um, or it could, it could apply to the, to the processes. And so uh, even if you're manufacturing what's considered a commodity, something that's been around forever, it may be that you can obtain a patent on the particular method of manufacture, assuming that is new and not obvious. And so I have a couple examples here just to put a little color on, on what I'm talking about. So one example is Bauer Hockey obtained a patent for a method of forming a hockey blade with a wrapped stitched core. And so they patented the particular process that they use to form this hockey blade. It may be that the hockey blade itself with the wrap stitch core is not independently patentable, uh, but in any event, they've patented the process to make that uh, hockey blade with the wrap stitch core. In a similar vein, Amazon has recently patented a method of on-demand apparel manufacturing. So clothing, suits, shirts, those types of things uh, are commodity type goods, can't be patented. But Amazon has received a patent for their particular method of on-demand manufacturing. So that's just two examples of how some companies have protected their particular processes of manufacturing uh, commodity type goods. Another type of patent is a design patent. A design patent is, is much different than a utility patent. Utility patent covers the functional nature um, of the good, the process, the article of manufacture. A design patent uh, protects the ornamental, it has to be the non-functional design of a particular product. So in other words, it protects the way something looks uh, rather than how it's constructed or used. And so uh, the benefit of having a design patent is you can exclude products um, in the marketplace having an identical design um, as well as any ornamental design that would deceive uh, what's considered an ordinary observer. So uh, this is a different aspect of patenting. And again, it goes to the, to the particular design, um, not the function of what your product is. And so while somebody can make the same product, generally speaking, they wouldn't be able to make it with the same design that you have patented. The, the term of a design patent is a little bit less than for utility patents. It's 14 years from the granting of a patent, of a design patent. So again, to put a little color on uh, what we're talking about here. So one of the most famous examples of a design patent is the original Coca-Cola design of the, you know, the, uh, the iconic Coca-Cola bottle with the curves on the side. Now, of course, Coca-Cola can't protect a bottle itself. Glass bottles have been around forever, but they were able to protect the, their design of the, of the grooves and curves of their particular bottle, uh, which is now expired. 
Um, and, and a more modern example, Oakley um, has a uh, patent on their a, a particular design of their eyeglasses. So they haven't they can't or they haven't patented per se an eyeglass, but they uh, in this particular example have patented a, a particular uh, design. And so that's uh, I think these these two examples highlight um, that you can make commodity type goods, but still uh, if you're able to get a design patent, protect the particular design, not function uh, of the of the product with a design patent. Okay, let's move on to trademarks. So trademark, is, a trademark or a service mark uh, is a word, name, symbol, device, or any combination of the two. Uh, and so simple word mark is Bose, which is an iconic brand. Um, and an example of a combination of word and a symbol would be the Philips, the iconic Philips uh, logo that has the word Philips at top and then the, the circular logo with the shapes. Um, at, at the bottom. So a trademark is something that's used to identify the, your goods and service and distinguish them from others. And so uh, branding is 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 quite uh, can can be quite powerful. And so not only do trademarks uh, apply to traditional uh, things such as word names, but also non-traditional trademarks. So one of the best examples of that is uh, the color pink for the Owens Co uh, Corning uh, insulation. Pink is a color that you would not normally attribute to insulation, but Owens Corning has been able to trademark the color pink in connection with uh, its insulation products. Also, trademarks can be uh, cover the visual appearance of a product, um, and that's considered what's, what's, what's called trade dress. And so a recent example of that is Apple was able to trademark the, its particular design and layout as trade dress for its Apple Store. All right, there's various ways to protect uh, trademarks, uh, ranging from starting with common law. And this starts when you as a manufacturer start using the mark uh, on goods and in association with the goods that you make. And so common law, there's nothing that you need to do uh, to register. They, they uh, are enforced in court if you decide, uh, if you seek to enforce that remedy. So there are, there are many more proofs that you need to bring in court to enforce what's considered a common law mark. But there may be rights that uh, are derived from using the mark uh, for an established period of time. There's also the possibility of state registration. Each state maintains its own register, and that can be enforced under state law. These terms are 10 years and are usually renewable uh, indefinitely. The best protection uh, is federal registration, longer term and renewable indefinitely. And there's many advantages of uh, federal registration over state and common law marks. First, you give public notice of the trademark and the federal registration. There is a legal presumption of ownership of nationwide rights. So if you walk into court, you already have a legal presumption that you own the nationwide rights to that mark. Uh, you have the ability to bring an action in federal court as opposed to state court. And having a registered trademark allows you the right to use the, the R in a circle symbol which can only be used if you have a registration. Uh, if you use the R in a circle without having a registered mark, there are possible civil and criminal uh, remedies. Um, if you don't have an R in a circle, you can only use the TM symbol uh, in connection with the mark. Another benefit is the listing in the US Trademark Office uh, database. Anybody can go online uh, to USPTO.gov and um, it's off, you know, if your trademark is listed in the uh, U.S. Trademark Register, it can have the, um, the impact of um, uh, having your competitors see that mark and choose something different. Uh, so you don't, it, it, it may stop them from up front using something, your mark or something confusingly similar. Okay, 
Uh, moving on to copyrights. Copyrights are ex governed exclusively by federal law. And so uh, a copyright is an original work of authorship. Uh, and so it's something fixed. It's, it can't be a, it can't be a uh, intangible idea. It has to be something that's fixed in a tangible medium. So what does that mean? That means words printed on a page or images printed on a page or on a computer screen. So anything that's fixed to uh, a, a visual image or a printed image is protected by copyright. And so copyright gives you many rights, including the ability to re reproduce that copyrighted work, make derivative works. A derivative work is something that derives from or borrows from that copyrighted work. And it allows you to distribute copies of that copyrighted work. It gives you that bundle of rights um, that are associated with copyright. So um, in the manufacturing industry, what that means is it can protect any uh, variety of written materials. It, mm -hmm. can, it can protect product manuals, brochures, packaging, catalogs, articles, uh, any white papers that your company uh, produces, presentation, training materials, uh, and it also may apply to computer software and documentation that goes with that software. So really a wide variety of different types of materials uh, that could be uh, subject to copyright protection. Now, the ownership of copyrights just by U.S. copyright law usually vests in the author of the work, um, except for employee works, since that would be any of your employees in the manufacturing space. Those are considered works made for hire, and the employer, the manufacturer, would be considered the author of those works. So if you have an author developing and writing an instruction manual or brochure that goes with your product, the copyright would vest um, in the name of the company uh, producing the piece. And the term for copyrights can be quite long. And so for a corporation, uh, for work for hire, it's the shorter of 95 years after first publication of that work or 120 years after creation. So a copyright can extend for quite an extraordinary amount of time. Okay, finally, trade secrets is the last of the four areas uh, of, of, of IP protection. And trade secrets, as the name uh, suggests, must be secret. And so as long as the secrets are kept confidential, and that's the key to trade secrets, trade secrets can potentially have a longer life than patents or copyrights. And so a great example of that, of course, is uh, the Coca-Cola secret formula. Coca-Cola, over 120, 150 years ago, could have decided to seek a patent for the formula of Coca-Cola. It chose to seek trade secret. Had it chosen patenting protection, it would have been protected for a finite period of time at which point it would have, uh, the formula would have transferred to the public domain. But because they've decided to keep it trade secret, it is, uh, it is still a formula not known to this day. The key though is it has to be kept confidential. So if it was ever disclosed by an employee, then it's no longer secret. If someone figured out how to reverse engineer the formula, then it's no longer secret. Uh, so again, it's a trade secret as, low, as, low, as long as it's kept confidential. So it's possible it could have a shorter life than patents or copyrights. Again, de depending on whether the trade secret gets out or if someone is able to figure it out independently. And trade secrets can be protected by both federal and state law. And the protection under federal law is a recent change within the last couple of years. Uh, there was legislation enacting a federal right uh, to trade secret protection. So in the manufacturing industry, uh, can have wide variety, or wide applicability of trade secrets. Manufacturing processes, designs, drawings, uh, the processes implemented in software, formulas or ingredients of your products, uh, also your business strategies, business plans, financial information, operating manuals, training manuals, uh, 
could be custom information as well. A lot of it varies uh, depending on uh, state law or, on the, or federal law or depending on the particular facts and circumstances. But all of these are examples of things that have been protected in the past. Okay, with that, uh, with that uh, uh, groundwork uh, of the various IP protections, let's, let's take a minute to talk about some risks and vulnerabilities in the, in the manufacturing industry. So manufacturers, um, like other companies, have considerable resources invested in, in machinery, tools, personnel, uh, products, inventory, processes, and much more. IP theft can not only impact, impact the manufacturer's uh, bottom line financially, but it also can have a severe impact on uh, delivering products on time and on budget to customers. Uh, it can have devastating impacts um, depending on whether it's internal, external, or both. And so the challenges for manufacturers is there's so many different areas that are vulnerable uh, to IP uh, theft, and that includes your manufacturing facilities, your manufacturing equipment. It also includes uh, computer equipment or anything that uh, any any sort of equipment that the company owns. And so it's vitally important uh, for manufacturers to implement stringent security standards and procedures. Um, at, the at the facility level, the equipment level, um, to make sure that these things are locked down. Uh, there are vulnerabilities uh, from personnel, your employees, uh, your partners. And so uh, taking reasonable steps to uh, implement these security practices and protocols is not only important for tangible things, but also your employees and, and the folks that you work with. There's also a risk uh, with your vendors and the supply chain. And so there are often things that need to be shared with vendors and supply chain. And this is, uh, this is highly complex and depends on the particular manufacturer. But you are continuously exposed as a manufacturer to a variety of internal and external risks from your vendors and supply chain. All right. With that backdrop in mind, uh, let's turn to some best practices uh, to protect IP. And so these are a series of uh, uh, tips that are meant to build upon some of the things we talked about earlier in the presentation um, on the, the fundamentals of IP. Okay, so here's what we, here's what we plan to cover is, um, and, and th these six uh, best practices are meant to be um, covered from a comprehensive standpoint. So all of these together form a comprehensive strategy to protecting IP. And so we'll talk about conducting IP audits, uh, implementing a strategic plan, and then protecting uh, your confidential info, inventions, brand, and content with some of the building blocks of IP that we talked about earlier. So number one, conducting IP audits. So what is an IP audit? It's a review of the, uh, of the manufacturer's IP assets and related risks and opportunities. So this sounds good in theory, but why conduct an IP audit? And the main thing is, to help assess, preserve, and enhance IP. So uh, many companies think they have IP, but they don't have a list or, or a catalog of what that IP is. Are there patents? Are there trademarks? Whether they're common law, state, or federal? Are there trade secrets? Are there copyright material? And so doing an IP audit uh, on a regular basis whatever makes most sense for your particular manufacturing company or your particular industry, whether that's quarterly, biannually, annually, the most important thing is, is scheduling a regular time to conduct an IP audit to make sure that, that you as a manufacturing company know what it is that you believe is your IP. 
one of the things that an IP audit allows you to do is determine if there's any defects in these IP rights. For example, perhaps an employee was brought over and brought some of their own IP that you believe is the company's IP, but there may be different rights associated with that. As another example, uh, perhaps uh, a patent is not properly assigned or a trademark is in the name of one company. Conducting an IP audit can allow you to uh, systematically and regularly correct any defects in IP rights. Um, and in correcting these defects can be critical before there is IP theft. It also allows you to implement best practices for IP asset management. Knowing what you have can allow you to make sure that you uh, properly protect each of those IP assets. Now, an IP audit generally has a number of different steps, uh, which may include first step, identifying all possible IP, which can be, uh, which can be a, a large task, especially if this is done the first time. Second is to determine the ownership of those as assets, uh, and that can be done in conjunction with records at the US Patent Office, for example, or US Copyright Office, uh, or making sure the company has maintained that foundation. Determine, step three, determine the validity of those IP assets. How enforceable are they? Step four is also determining where are the, where are the holes in IP protection. Perhaps there is a uh, manufacturing process which is um, uh, unique and novel uh, in, in a way that none of your competitors are using. Perhaps you haven't sought protection for it and in this process this process of an IP audit will allow you uh, to identify those things uh, and to shore protection in areas where there's not IP protection. Step five is you may be using IP of others. Maybe it's a partner, maybe it's a distributor. Um, and this, this IP audit will allow you to correct the usage, you know, the correct, to verify correct usage of any third party IP. There are other steps that you can also conduct uh, doing qualitative measures of, of the value of your IP and also analyze third party risks. But the most important thing is doing an IP audit at a systematic um, and regular interval. Okay. On a related note to conducting an IP audit is once you have um, the results of the audit in place, it's then taking that to the next step and implementing a strategic IP plan. So every, every business has some form of business plan. And so the strategic IP plan fits in hand in hand with the business plan. It's uh, the strategic IP plan is meant to prompt the development, acquisition, maintenance, and exploita exploitation of IP assets just as a business plan would do with material assets. And so this is going to vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, but it's meant to set a strategic um, forward thinking plan of how your company uh, plans to protect its IP, not only today, but going forward in the future. And so as an important component of the IP plan, it's um, establishing that infrastructure internally. And so many companies, many manufacturers will, will uh, establish an IP committee, which uh, may involve many different voices. Could be technical voices, could be production voices. Um, it could include attorneys. It could include, uh, include business folks. But there can be many different voices um, in that committee um, to help implement a strategic plan going forward to determine how much protection, how often protection to seek, um, having a plan that's hand in hand with a business plan um, is critical um, to protecting these IP assets in the manufacturing industry. Okay, with this, once you have the IP audit conducted, you have the strategic plan in place. Now it's important to uh, take a deeper dive and protect the different facets of, of uh, protectable IP in your manufacturing business. 
So first and foremost, um, for many manufacturers, is protecting the confidential information. It may not be that your um, particular good that you're making is pat could be patent protected. It may be that you can't patent the method. Um, and so trade secrets uh, often take on uh, critical importance in the manufacturing space. And so uh, trade secrets has also taken on critical importance in the last couple of years. As I mentioned earlier, there's now federal protection in addition to state protection for trade secrets. And so one of the most critical things to trade secrets is many businesses, many manufacturers uh, believe that they have trade secrets. Um, and it, it's critical to get out in front and identify, just as you would with patented te te technology, identify what it is that you think are your company's trade secrets. So many companies um, are taking the affirmative step of cataloging trade secrets and cataloging them just like they would in invention disclosure. In a, in a database that identify who knows the trade secrets, what the trade secret is, um, wh who, you know, who has access to the trade secret, and what steps are going to be taken to, uh, to limit access. Perhaps it's an encrypted document that only a select number of people at the company can access. Um, perhaps it's a physical document or physical thing that's locked in a safe that only certain people have access to. Identifying and cataloging the trade secrets allows you to systematically um, come up with a plan to determine how you're going to keep these trade secrets confidential. Because as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, once the trade secret is out of the bag, it's no longer a trade secret. And so the more progressive companies and progressive manufacturers are taking the affirmative steps to identify and catalog the trade secrets before it's too late, before an employee leaves uh, and takes a whole bunch of information and you're trying to determine if that's trade secret or not. If you have a catalog in place, then if you are, uh, have to face the unfortunate incident of IP theft, you can easily turn to the catalog to determine what was taken when it was taken, who, who took it, and, and whether or not they had proper access to it. And so in going hand in hand with this identification and cataloging of trade secrets is establishing procedures. And these are day-to-day -day procedures and practices, having a confidentiality policy, labeling your trade secrets. So either on the document or the thing itself, it says, company trade secret. So everyone knows that it is a trade secret. It must be kept confidential in the company. And as I mentioned, limiting physical and electronic access to trade secrets. If every employee at the company has access to a trade secret, it may no longer be a trade secret in the, in the near future. If you limit that trade secret on a need to know basis, it increases the possibility that 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 thing will be kept as a trade secret. On a related note, it's important to establish exit procedures and practices. So conducting exit interviews with employees so they know what's trade secret and what must be kept as business confidential information. Also during these exit uh, uh, procedures, it's securing the return of documentation that includes flash drives, that includes computers, that includes all files that an employee may have added access to. Because once they leave the company, they're no longer in your control. So it's important to have these exit procedures and practices established. On that note, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good practice to have employee agreements. Uh, especially with key employees who have access to these confidential trade secrets. So having non-disclosure provisions, uh, possibly non-compete provisions, and also making sure that employees are assigning their IP. So there's no question if that employee decides to leave the company later on, that that IP is properly assigned to the company. And so employee agreements up front 
with the appropriate employees can help protect that. Also, NDAs. Anytime you're sharing information with a partner, a distributor, anybody in the supply chain, a vendor, having an NDA in, uh, agreement in place so not only you have legal protection, but you, uh, that other party knows um, that that must be protected can be critical. And so an NDA should be used whenever the company is disclosing anything that could be arguably deemed confidential information outside the, the, the company. With an NDA in place, um, it can help uh, reinforce the notion that that information is confidential. Without an NDA in place, and you disclose that information, it's no longer confidential, and it can no longer be a trade secret. Okay, number four, protect your inventions. So we're talking about patents. Patenting can take time, um, and it's, it can be an expensive proposition. Filing a patent can cost uh, with uh, legal fees. Just ballpark can cost anywhere from five to 25,000 or more uh, to draft and file a patent application. Um, just um, prosecuting the patent in the United States can take several years to pursue foreign um, patents can be tens of thousands. Uh, in some instances, depending on how many jurisdictions you pursue, it could be hundreds of thousands. It can be very expensive, but the benefits of patent protection uh, can be significant. It, um, as opposed to a trade secret, a patent can protect against IP theft. If, because it, it, uh, a patent protects um, you from anybody who's using it as long as your patent is live. And so this protects both internal and external threats. The external threats being your competitors or counterfeiters who are looking to copy your products and enter your space. A patent can also have defensive purposes, give you the ability to manufacture. If you have a new Pat, you know, a good that is possible to protect by patents or a process that's possible to protect by patents. It may be only a matter of time if you don't patent it that your competitor will. And to have to defend against that um, can be very expensive. And so to have, the ability, to have a patent um, may serve a defensive measure, measure um, uh, and dissuade uh, uh, others from going after you. A patent, by its very nature, is a limited monopoly, so it can help increase market position. And so any bottlenecks that you can create uh, for your competitors can be significant. And even if your competitor can make a good in the same class, if they can't make it with your patented features, that gives you a market position. It can help increase your market position. Also, having a patent can give you the ability to license. Without a patent in place, someone else can copy your product. And so um, if they don't have to come turn to you for information, um, so without a patent, others may be, free, be able to freely uh, make the same product. By having a patent, you may uh, have introduced the, the possibility of a license stream where you can give others permission in exchange for uh, a revenue stream. So we touched upon at the beginning the different types of patents, and these are uh, utility and design have uh, protect quite different things. So utility patents, again, goes to the manufacturing processes, machines, articles of manufacture, uh, and compositions of matter. Uh, utility patents can be quite expensive, as I mentioned, uh, but that's where provisional applications um, may be something to consider. Provisional patents are usually much more streamlined. Um, there are less formal requirements with the patent office. And it gives you the ability to delay uh, having to file a full-blown utility uh, uh, patent application by 12 months. It also gives you the ability to, uh, to put patent pending on a product, which could be beneficial. So provisional applications uh, can have a good strategic use, especially if you're not sure if you want to 
pour the resources into patenting, it gives you an extra 12 months uh, to make that decision. Design patents in recent years um, have taken on increased popularity. Uh, and one of the reasons was is Apple has been very aggressive in its, uh, in its very public lawsuit with Samsung in which there were some utility patents asserted, but also design patents on the shape of the iPhone. And um, this has been one um, thing that has um, you know, led to uh, design patents in popular par parlance um, being talked about a lot more. And so design patents actually are on the, on the uptick in terms of uh, companies filing for design patents and receiving design patents. And again, it protects the ornamental nature, not the utility of the, of the product, but how you make it and how your, you know, uh, how your particular design is um, may be important and it can, it can preclude your competitors from making that same design, which may be important in, in your uh, particular industry. Number five is protect your brand. So trademarks uh, can be very important because they give you the ability to differentiate your company and your products from those of your competitors. It's your identity, and it allows you to build your business and invest in the brand, and especially something that may have broad commercial appeal. The nice thing about trademarks, uh, they're relatively in inexpensive protect. Um, uh, and this is uh, including at the federal level. So a filing, um, you know, the, the filing fee with the trademark office is uh, it's, it's 275 per class. Um, you could probably, with legal fees, um, you know, in the vicinity of $1,000 to file each trademark, assuming it's a single class. And then it's relatively inexpensive, assuming there are no roadblocks down the road uh, to obtain a trademark. And so... Uh, you know, trademarks are something that, uh, unfortunately, some manufacturers think of too late. It's when their competitor has adopted um, a, a, you know, a name that they give to a line of goods for their, as, you know, as their own. Having a, for, a federal registration in place uh, can, be, can be critical to precluding that competitor from using that same name or confusingly similar name. And it, it can be uh, critical to preventing marketplace con uh, confusion. The nice thing with a federal registration is it, is it gives you presumptive nationwide rights. And, and, and especially in today's internet space where goods are sold nationwide very easily through Amazon or other uh, online sellers or directly from a manufacturer nationwide, having those nationwide rights in a federal trademark uh, can be very important. And number six is protecting co content. And so copyright is something that um, is often not at top of mind, but it really can be the easiest and most expensive IP to obtain. The great thing with a copyright registration is if you, if you register before there's infringement, you can be entitled to statutory damages, uh, which can be anywhere from a minimum of 750 to a maximum of 30,000 per work. So if there's just one work, one, one copy, uh, the minimum is 750 and it can go all the way to 30,000. Uh, and if there's willful infringement, that can go up to 150,000 per work. Uh, but the key is you have to register it before there's infringement. Uh, registration is very easy, very straightforward at the copyright office. Uh, you can do, it can be done online. The filing fee per application is typically uh, $55 per application. And so systematically uh, filing for copyrights, whether it's brochures, whether it's catalogs, whether it's packaging, whether it's uh, instruction manuals, uh, having those registrations on file before there's infringement is, very, is, is, is relatively straightforward and relatively inexpensive. But it's something that's often not top of mind. Um, it's something that, that should be um, one of the things that manufacturers uh, consider to protect their IP. Now, copyrights, uh, as, as opposed to patents and trademarks, which you have to get registered uh, 
course, unless the trademark is, is common law. Copyright, the thing with copyright is you don't have to actually have it registered with the Copyright Office to, to have uh, rights in it. Anything that's created uh, may have, uh, may be a copyrightable work. That being said, as I, as I mentioned before, having that registration in place before there's infringement will be the difference between whether you are able to receive statutory damages or actual damages. And the statutory damages are often a uh, incremental factor higher than, um, than actual damages. A copyright notice, as, so as opposed to the R in a circle for trademarks, which can only be used uh, with something that's actually registered, a copyright notice doesn't um, doesn't uh, have to be registered for you to use the, the copyright uh, the Cena circle. So therefore, it's it's um, usually good practice to use the, the Cena circle on anything that you, as a manufacturer, uh, deem to be your copyrighted uh, material. So it informs others of the company's underlying uh, claim. To copyright. So if you have the Cena circle on your manual, you are telling the world that you believe you have a copyright, um, irrespective of whether you've actually registered that. But again, best practice is to systematically register uh, those manuals and any version of those manuals. Um, it offers inexpensive protection um, and is a good step. So that was the last uh, best practice. Uh, we're at the end of of, of the webinar. Again, those six best practices are meant to be a comprehensive plan and used in conjunction with each other. Um, but those, uh, you know, following those practices uh, should give manufacturers a leg up on uh, their competitors. So that is the uh, that is the conclusion of today's um, presentation. I don't see any questions from the audience. If you do have a question, feel free to submit it. I'd be uh, happy to answer it. I'll give uh, folks a minute or two to write in their questions. Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending. I uh, hope you found this useful and uh, if you, I encourage you to, to uh, register and view the, the remaining parts of the series of our uh, manufacturing series, which uh, progresses from Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday this week. Thank you very much.